The subject of this video is the method of initial rates, and this is an approach for determining the kinetic orders of reactants in a reaction through experimental measurements. It's based on measurement of the initial rate, which for reasons we'll see very shortly is a highly convenient rate to measure since we have knowledge of the concentrations of reactants at the initial point in the reaction. By measuring initial rates and systematically varying initial reaction conditions, we can get a sense of kinetic orders and even measure the rate constant once all the orders are known. So to introduce the idea of the method of initial rates, I want to roll back to a graph where we depicted the various types of rates in an earlier video. And recall that we identified the initial rate as this point at t equals zero. The slope of the tangent line at t equals zero is the instantaneous initial rate. And in practice, we can get very close to that by measuring concentrations at the initial time point and a time point very shortly after the initial time point. We can kind of get as arbitrarily close to the instantaneous rate as we'd like to get within the limits of our experimental equipment. So we can measure this initial rate as a delta concentration divided by delta time. The basis of the method of initial rates is doing that for a series of reaction runs that are very systematically constructed. And we'll talk through what that looks like in the remainder of this video and look at a practice problem. So to apply what's called the method of initial rates to determine kinetic orders, we will use initial concentrations of the reactants known from stoichiometry and initial rates measured over a very short time interval at the start of the reaction. Now, the convenient thing about initial rates is that we have this knowledge of the reactant concentrations. We assume that the reactant concentrations are what they are before any reaction has taken place. So we only need stoichiometry to determine those concentrations. This is the beauty of this method. So we can write the rate law and plug in actual numbers for the concentrations and for the rate at that initial time point without actually making any measurements of concentration really, aside from, for example, the volume of stock solutions we mixed up to prepare each reaction mixture. So it's very easy to calculate the initial concentrations of reactants. We don't need to make any measurements to do that. What we do then is we vary the initial concentration systematically and we observe the effects on the initial rate. And the typical output of a method of initial rates experiment will be a table with multiple reaction runs, the initial concentrations of one or more reactants, and the corresponding initial rates, and those are measured in the typical units of molarity per second or some other stand-in for concentration per second or some other time unit. So in the first experiment, we start with some kind of baseline concentration, A sub I, and we measure the initial rate, and let's call that R. Then we run the reaction again, modifying the initial concentration of A by some factor C. And this may be doubling it, this may be cutting it in half, this may be multiplying it by three or some arbitrary amount. It just depends on how we, we set up the experiment. Doubling is convenient and is something that you'll often see, but this is not necessarily a doubling. That's why I've introduced this general factor C here by which we multiply that kind of baseline concentration. We measure the initial rate again for this second run of the reaction. And one of three things can happen. If the initial rate remains the same, if the initial rate is unchanged, even with a, con a change in concentration of A, well then we can conclude that the reaction is zero order in A because C raised to the zero power times R will simply be equal to R. So we are able to infer that the order, the exponent on the concentration of A must be zero. In other words, the reaction is zero order in A. The exponent in the rate law, I should say. Something else that can happen is that the rate might increase by the factor C or change by the factor C more generally. In that case, our observed initial rate will be C times R. And this tells us that the exponent on the A concentration must be one, right? Since the initial rate changed by a factor C to the first power. Put another way, the reaction must be first order in A. A third possible outcome is that the initial rate in experiment two is C squared times R in experiment one. And here, because the rate is changing with respect to C squared times R, we can conclude that the reaction is second order in A. The exponent in the rate law 
on that A concentration term is 2. And so you can see how these two measurements of the initial rate in trial 1 and trial 2 give us the numbers we need to infer the orders of reaction for the various reactants. And if we have more than one reactant, we're going to need more than two trials in order to do this. And we systematically vary the concentrations so that between any given pair of experiments, one or all of the other concentrations are controlled and one of the concentrations is systematically varied. Let's explore what we mean by this in a practice problem. In this practice problem, we're asked to use the initial rates method and the given experimental data to determine the rate law and the value of the rate constant for the reaction given here. We haven't talked about how to calculate the rate constant yet, but you'll see that once we've determined the kinetic orders and the form of the overall rate law, we have enough information with just one of the initial rates in one of the experiments to determine the rate constant. So we have 2NO reacting with Cl2 to give 2NOCl. So this reaction has two reactants. We're going to need at least three experimental trials, three, at least three runs of the reaction in order to determine the orders of NO and Cl2. And to begin with this, what we need to do is isolate the experiments where each reactant is systematically changed while the other's concentration is held constant. So for example, if we look at trials one and two, we can see that the NO concentration is controlled or kept constant between trials one and two, while the Cl2 concentration is increased by a factor of 1.5 from trial one to trial two. And I really like this problem because it doesn't use a simple doubling. You'll see a lot of examples out there in the internet where concentrations are simply doubled. Here we actually need to think through this mathematically, I think, to really get a handle on, on what's going on. Once we've spotted that, we know that trials 1 and 2 are going to give us insight into the kinetic order of Cl2, since that's the concentration that's changing between these trials. Next, we need to ask ourselves, how does the initial rate change between trials 1 and 2? Well, we can see that the initial rate increases by a factor of 1.5, and that's equal to the factor by which the concentration of Cl2 was increased. From this, we can infer that the reaction is first order in Cl2, since an increase in concentration by a factor of 1.5 led to an increase in the initial rate by a factor of 1.5 as well, or 1.5 to the first power. There's where first order comes into play. What about NO? Well, the NO concentration changes between trials 1 and 3. And here again, the NO concentration is increased by a factor of 1.5. At the same time, and this is worth pointing out, the Cl2 concentration is controlled, is kept constant at 0.1 molar across these two trials. So trials 1 and 3 are going to give us insight into the kinetic order of NO. Let's call that factor by which we increase the concentration, D, now we look at the initial rates in trials 1 and 3 and see what happened. What happened here? Well, the initial rate increased by a factor of 2.25 from trial 1 to trial 3. And this turns out to be D squared. From this, we can infer that the reaction is second order in NO, since an increase in the NO concentration by a factor of 1.5 led to an increase in the initial rate by a factor of 1.5 squared, or 1.5 to the second power, and their second order kinetics in NO. And there it is. We've determined the two kinetic orders for the two reactants. And the overall form of the rate law, to, to find that, we simply plug in those exponents into our general form for a rate law with the rate constant on the right-hand side times concentration raised to the corresponding order. And that's equal to the rate on the left-hand side. But one thing we have left to do is determine the rate constant. But we have enough information in any of these three trials to calculate a value for the rate constant. And generally speaking, using any of the three trials should result in k that is the same within experimental error. So for example, we can look at trial 1, whose initial rate was 0 0.003 molar per second. That is the initial rate, and that is equal to k times the initial concentration of NO squared times the initial concentration of Cl2 in that trial. We're just plugging in the initial concentrations from the table in the first row to fill in numbers on that right-hand side. And you'll notice that K is the only unknown remaining in this equation. 
And so we can calculate a value for k, which comes out to 3 per molar squared per second. And notice the units of the rate constant here. The units correspond to inverse molar squared, inverse seconds. And the inverse molar squared term ensures that when we multiply by three concentration factors, two for the NO and one for the Cl2, we end up with units of molarity in the numerator, and the rate ends up with units of molarity per second. We'll return to this point shortly on a future slide.